In the early morning of June 14, 2006, two BNSF freight trains are travelling on the same line in opposite directions on the Stockton subdivision. A routine crossing at the Kismet siding in Madura County should ensure the two trains pass by safely. However, the inexplicable actions of the southbound train crew led to the two trains colliding. The investigation into the accident uncovered possible lies, half-truths, and one shocking revelation regarding the actions of the crew at fault. This is the story of the Kismet train collision. With the largest freight train network in the world, the USA boasts more than 140,000 miles of track. Up to 22,000 trains carry more than 1.6 billion tonnes of goods daily. These goods range from materials and timber, to coal, steel, flammable gases and liquids, and much more. Although there are more than 700 railroad companies across the United States, with more than 23 billion in annual revenue, BNSF is the largest, followed closely by Union Pacific, with Canadian National, CSX, and Norfolk Southern the next largest. Of course, there are bound to be accidents on a network this large. In fact, on any given day across the United States, an average of three freight trains derail. While most incidents are minor, some go down in infamy, much like the Kismet train collision. At around 8.25pm on June 13th, 2006, the crew of BNSF MRIC BAR1-13, or what I'll now refer to as Southbound Train 1, signed on for duty at the BNSF Richmond Rail Yard on the shores of San Francisco Bay. Traversing the Stockton subdivision, Southbound Train 1 would stop in Pittsburgh before making its way to Fresno, California. It wasn't until around 10.35pm that the three-man crew of one engineer, a conductor and a brakeman departed the Richmond Yard with seven locomotives and ten wagons. However, before departing Pittsburgh at around 1.50am, they acquired a further 45 wagons, bringing the train's length to just short of a mile and a trailing weight of more than 5,000 tonnes. As Train 1 continued towards Fresno, two hours later in Fresno, the crew of BNSF, US BD PK C1-11, or what I'll now refer to as Northbound Train 2, was signing on for duty. Departing Fresno at around 5am, bound for Sacramento, the two-man crew, made up of an engineer and a conductor, would take the train north via the Stockton subdivision. However, due to circumstances outside their control, the journey would not be a long one. In fact, less than one hour. Throughout a significant part of the route, the Stockton subdivision consists of just one line. Ensuring train separation is the centralised traffic controller. On that morning, the controller intended for southbound train 1 to wait near Kismet until northbound train 2 arrived. Train 2, on arrival, would enter the siding to pass train 1. These instructions would be communicated to the drivers via the trackside signals. At around 5.51am, the northbound Train 2 approached the small town of Kismet in Madura County. With instructions to enter the siding to allow the waiting Train 1 to depart, the engineer slowed his train to around 40 miles per hour. However, upon exiting the slight right-hand curve just before the siding, the crew of Train 2 noticed Train 1 was still moving. Too fast to safely jump, they hit the floor, took cover, and hoped for the best. Somehow, surviving inside their now mangled wreckage, the engineer suffered a fractured pelvis and internal injuries, while his conductor received lacerations and a concussion. But thankfully, they were both still alive. So, what had gone wrong? Let's rewind and look at the actions of the other train. At around 5.51am, southbound train 1 continues on the main line as instructed, past the north end points of the Kismet siding. Receiving a yellow over red signal, indicating a speed limit not exceeding 30 miles per hour, 
and to be prepared to stop ahead, Train 1 did not adjust speed, instead maintained 44 miles per hour. The engineer would later claim the signal had been clear. At this point, the red light at the south end of the siding should have been visible, indicating to stop short of the points to await Train 2. However, still 14 miles per hour above their speed limit, instead of slowing, they made no changes. As they approached a mere 1,000 feet from the south end points and subsequent red light, with a direct view of an oncoming headlight, the crew of Train 1 finally applied the emergency brake. Realising an impact was unavoidable, all three men jumped out a door, the engineer and brakeman received bruises while the conductor broke his ankle. The investigation into the incident was handled by the FRA or Federal Railroad Administration. In line with standard procedure, all five members of the crew were tested for substance and alcohol use. Although the crew of northbound train 2 were interviewed, the investigation team were more interested in knowing why the crew of southbound train 1 had failed to stop. Contradicting the signal transcript download, in his interview, the engineer of southbound train 1 claimed the signal at the first set of points showed clear, hence why he had not slowed the train. And when the red signal at the far end of the siding became visible, he had applied the emergency brake. However, as mentioned above, according to the locomotive event recorder, the brake was applied a mere 1,000 feet from the red signal and eventual impact. It's hard to see how he did not spot it sooner. Despite this, he claimed to be well rested and denied falling asleep. During their interview, the conductor said the first signal had changed to clear, and both he and the brakeman made the claim that sun glare had made spotting the red signal at the south end of the siding difficult. In the days following the accident, personnel from the FRA and BNSF performed post-accident signal testing. The test found no faults and suggested all signals had worked correctly and displayed the right colour at the time of the accident. However, a shocking revelation was about to come to light. Although four of the five tests had come back clear, the conductor of southbound train 1 had tested positive for the use of a highly forbidden substance. Although this was disturbing, it was unlikely to have played a significant role in the accident, given the engineer had been the one in control. On the 21st of June, seven days after the accident, the FRA and BNSF performed an accident reenactment in the same conditions and exact time of day. The reenactment confirmed all signals were unobstructed and that each signal was visible prior to the signal before it. However, contradicting the conductor and brakeman, both the reenactment and meteorological reports indicated the sun was still behind the mountains and sun glare would not have been an issue. It appears the conductor and brakeman may have claimed this to cover for the engineer and mask their own inaction in both calling the signals and challenging him sooner. In the end, the final conclusion by the FRA was a conservative one, stating that all indications were that the signal system functioned as intended, that signal visibility was not hampered by line of sight or daylight, and despite the claims by the crew of southbound train 1 that the first signal was clear and not yellow, there was no evidence to support the claim. The final line of the report simply says the probable cause of the accident was the failure of train 1 to comply with the automatic stop signal. Let me know your thoughts on the accident, and do you think the engineer had briefly fallen asleep? To watch my video of the Burlington train derailment, you can click the link on screen. And as always, thanks for watching.